bring up two guys. You know them well now. You know one of them as John Hoodling with that Jaguar sitting in that middle booth. He's been an animal. He's, a, he's just great to have in this uh, WTS family now. And in this corner, <laughs> at 6'1", 220 pounds, is SBG founder, WTS. Man, let's go. Anthony Del Medico, come on up. <laughs> you. <Yeah. laughs> Uh-oh. You guys believe all that stuff? Right there. All right, guys. Uh, everybody's got some issues, I'm sure, with omitted line items, not paying starter and ridge, not over honoring overhead and profit. Um, I heard I heard uh, Steve Badger mention that you know submitting subcontractor invoices. You know what rule or law is there that, and we can discuss this more in a minute. But you know why should we submit subcontractor invoices? Why? My film crew here, they don't submit. When, I, when they tell me their price, he's not telling me what he pays his people, he gives me a price. And so, there's another side of that that, do, why, why should we share that proprietary information with the insurance company? No different than they don't share their P&Ls with us. Our price is our price. But why don't we open up, guys? I know a lot of you guys got some questions for Steve, so I wanna use some of my time for you guys to air out some questions as we get started. Go ahead and ask away. All right, so Steve, Larry Bache. There Merlin. you are, thank you. How you doing, Merlin Law Group. All right, so I heard you talking about overhead and profit and how we discuss subcontractor invoices and you, know, you said reasonably likely to be incurred is the standard that you train your clients to assess whether or not an insured is entitled to overhead and profit. So I have two questions. One, why, is it, why does it matter then what if a roofer or a general contractor hires how many different subs, or if they have the general overhead to be able to do those additional trades? So if you're a general contractor or a roofing company that also does siding or can also do certain HVAC work, or if you want to sub that out, that's fine. Why is it relevant then in the assessment as to what the contractor's doing compared to whether or not insured is reasonable in retaining the services of a GC? So that's my first question. Well, let me answer that one real quick if I can, okay? Yep. Remember, it's uh, whether the involvement is reasonably likely. If you've got a, one contractor who does a whole bunch of, a general contractor, all right, who is coordinating a bunch of subs, absolutely reasonably likely. If it's one contractor who's doing all the work, but it's the type of job where it would be reasonably likely, typically to have a general contractor, I agree that it would be owed in that situation. So then why would the subcontractors invoices for subs or the general contractors sub invoices be relevant to determine that entitlement not the amount not Great the amount Booyah, baby. Great. Great. but the yeah. entitlement of that GC OMP yeah because yeah. under the Whitestone case in Texas somebody got greedy all right and now I've got authority from a federal judge that allows me to ask that question because someone was trying to jack a job up so high <coughs> all right that it did not reflect the reasonable cost that an insurance company would owe. All right, so now we are having to address what the reasonable costs are, all right, because we don't owe the biggest number that can come out of Xactimate. No, we agree. I mean, I agree with that, obviously, and I deal just like you do on both sides of that, that fraud issue, but my question wasn't the amount. I understand now that position that's new, but this has been going on for years, but I'm referring to the number of trades or the scope of work that's gonna be completed by that specific contractor, not the amount, but why now are they asking for subcontractor invoices to see if they're actually outsourcing that work? Because a lot of these contractors in here incur additional overhead to service their client in turn to make additional profit, right? So that overhead is not going to be reflected in a subcontractor invoice. And that's where I see the disconnect of an adjuster who doesn't have a contracting company, who's never ran a business, and I'm sitting there asking him in a deposition, do you believe this fully reflects the cost of the job? And they answer yes. So how do you, what are you doing to train the insurance industry that those subcontractor invoices aren't just what the cost of that repair job is, number one. And number two, again, why is it relevant to the entitlement to the policyholder? What these guys want doesn't matter. No offense, guys, it's not about you. It's about the policyholder. Reasonably likely to be incurred. Right, so I'm not training them just to pay the subcontractor number. 
I'm training them to look to that number, and then for a general contractor, if overhead and profit is warranted, to pay that on top of it. Absolutely. Right, I'm in, although in Whitestone, I could make the argument under the Whitestone case that I don't owe any overhead and profit, but I don't make that argument. I recognize that general contractor overhead and profit is payable when the involvement of a general contractor is reasonably necessary, and we'll pay it in that situation. Fair enough. We have, we have, we have situations Wait, with sub invoices where, and I know you guys experience this, where you're being asked to submit your invoices. I mean, what, where's, where's the law ruling that says you have to share your proprietary pricing with an insurance company? White there, stone. Is, there isn't one. Whitestone. White stone. In Texas, the Whitestone case says that's the amount actually incurred. Yeah, all right, so you got an argument elsewhere. Okay, I understand that. All right, uh, so you could still make the argument elsewhere, all right, that you're not entitled to it. Okay, but remember, insurance is a contract between the insurance company and the homeowner. Yeah, but a, con a contractor's contract is between him and a property owner, too. So I you, agree for, with that. For a contractor to be asked, I think a lot of people share information, they're not, they don't have to with the carrier to submit. Um, yeah. The other game that's going on with OMP that I see is, is it's not complicated enough. Everybody hearing that? And a, some guy at the desk adjuster, it's not complicated enough. He doesn't know what it's like to have to order drop materials, tear out the roof, do the siding, coordinate gutters. It sounds easy on their side, but it's actually coordination. And when we pay a sub, you know, I, I've been on the phone with desk adjuster and say, well, we're not paying you over in profit no matter what, even when you do submit the extra sub invoice. And the gutters are copper, gutter, whatever, the, gutter, the gutters are five bucks, 550 a liter foot in Xactimate. And they're not paying any overhead profits. So here we are paying that cost, even if we provide that subcontractor bid. Whether we supervise that sub or not, we pay a premium audit on subcontractor payroll as a, GL, as a, as a GC. How many guys pay, uh, is your GL rated on subcontractor payroll? First off the top, that's what a GC does. So if we have, if we have, if we, if we have, if we do an audit the other year, we have three million subcontractor payroll, we owe a check. So by virtue of writing a check to a subcontractor, we already incurred overhead, whether we supervise it or not, two, usually two to four percent. So it's already incurred overhead. So that whole argument, do you guys agree? You're, you're paying it. It doesn't matter if you supervise it, you're paying it just by writing a check. You're also paying somebody to write that check. And then you gotta have somebody watch the job. So overhead and profit, you know, sh should be on any, any case of multiple trades. Anthony, you're a real general contractor, okay? You hire subs, right? You actually hire subs. You do what a, re what a real general contractor does. And a lot of the jobs where we're getting asked for GCO and overhead and profit don't, include, don't involve real GCs. It's either a roofing contractor, and if he maybe coordinates some, some trades, I understand that. that. That's not true, because right. most roofing contractors now uh, sub out their labor. Well, How many you guys all... sub out their labor, the roofing contractors? <laughs> How many guys actually have employees? I mean, very, very few roofers these days have W-2 employees. So the, but the, the roofing contractor's overhead and profit, according to Xactimate, you may not like the pricing, but the roofing contractor's overhead and profit is built into the line items. Yes, it is. Xactimate's very clear on that. So, all right. So, so, okay, I got to pull oh, out my song? PowerPoint now. No. All right, send me okay. an email, and I will send you the info from Xactimate that yeah. says that. All right? It's true. All right, There's for um, timing... There's a there's a lot of um, a lot of things that Steve and I uh, we agree on we agree on uh, the fact that a contract it's a contract the insurance uh, pers policyholder pays he pays his premiums sometimes for years sometimes for decades and then when he has a loss he's expecting to be paid and paid on time to fix his home now. When a storm event happens, we know prices go up. It's very difficult. I lived in New Orleans when the, the town was shut down for three months. It was very difficult, very expensive to get stuff in there. And so contractors are sometimes, as we know, brought in because guess what? Somebody's got to chase these storms to fix the problem, right? Now, many of you guys, you live cool. on the road. Okay? And you've got a lot of expenses to do that. And homeowners, they need somebody like you because they have to have access to, to the subs. They've got to have access to the people that drive nails because they're not there. And you guys who have spent, I've met contractors here that have been here, roofers that have, that have been in the business 
for multi-generations, you have contacts with the people that can get there and fix the roofs quickly. Now, what Steve is talking about, I'm starting to see this. Every storm, we see the insurance industry do something new. They get, and, and, I, and I agree with Steve on this, that the insurance industry reacts. They react to conferences like this. They see what's going on here, and they adapt. And, and they adapt, I see them adapting every storm. And this is what I've started to see. One, one uh, an attorney brought me very similar situation to what was put up on here, where the tactic is where the roofing contractor goes, negotiates the price with the homeowner, and generally the homeowner says, you know what, I want to pay what the insurance will agree to. So they do that. And I've seen one that came across my desk where a contractor went roofing contractor and met with the contractor for the insurance company. They hired a foremost TPA firm to research the market on price and scope of that roof. Now, they had agreed, the insurance company, that they were going to deal with the contractor and the contractor was doing the job. So the contractor goes out and negotiate or discuss the price price and scope with the expert on the other side. And they agree on a price and scope. Co contractor then gets his subs together and they complete the job. They finish the job. They agree on a number, how much it's going to be. Now, that roofer didn't have to decide to do it. He could have gone on to another job, but he agreed on the price. And they agreed on the scope. And he finished the roof. After the roof was done, the insurance company then starts speaking with the policyholder and starts saying, you know what, I think he charged you too much. Because, of course, they're adverse. So they start then trying to dig into the relationship between the contractor and the subs and starts contacting to try to find out what the profit is. And they're starting to do this more and more. And, you know, my law firm, uh, about 35 years ago, we tried one of the first cases having to do with intentional interference with a contract. Now, I will tell you, you all need to be, be careful of this because this tactic the tactic of once you agree on price and scope, then they go behind you to try to take out your profit is happening. That is happening. And so we agree on that, and you need to be careful. One, one thing to add to that is, uh, hoo-ah, booyah, John. <laughs> the PA accusations, we could spend all day talking about that stuff, but, you know, a contractor does a job, you know, especially in Texas where they're, where they're, pu they're pushing this a little, little harder than other states. Contractor finishes a job, does a job. Where, where do you not have the right to call and discuss your method of repair, your scope, your price, safety issues, code-related issues, with any knucklehead on the insurance side, their agent, their engineer, or whatnot? I mean, we're, and, this, and this is becoming a problem because some people are construing that conversation with a desk adjuster as acting as a public adjuster. And it's really a play on words, right guys? At the end of the day, though, you're the contractor building a job. You're making the customer whole, whole again. Insurance company's paying the bill, I get it. But how do you not, in, in the world of common sense, how do you not discuss your, your method of repair, your price, your scope, you know, when it comes to all those kind of issues? I'm sympathetic to the issue. That's why I said I threw up the really shitty Patrick Swayze movie, all right? But it tells a good message. Be nice, all right? And I want my clients to be nice and talk about it, okay? So, but they're reaching the point where they're not nice back to us, and we have a problem. Now, the bigger issue is this is not an insurance industry-driven issue. Unauthorized practice of public adjusting is being pushed by who? The Lobbyists. PAs. Lobbyists. Ah, the public adjusters. Paid for by the carriers. Yeah, the public adjusters. This is a hotter issue with the PAs. Unconstitutional state statutes. Yeah, the PAs push this very hard because they view negotiation of claims as their area. All right, they got a license to do this, and contractors shouldn't be able to do but it. The contractor's license to discuss, and is actually the expert on repairability 
warranties, what storm damage actually, how it affects shingles, much, right. more, than, much more than I think an adjuster is, so, well, public adjusters are good at it too, but we're the ones that work with the materials every day. So if I pick up the phone and I notice, hey, that's a, that's a warranty issue or that's a workmanship issue or it's a storm issue, this is my price. Hey, by the way, we have this code, it's our value, yada, 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 I need an extra 1.2 million on a two TPO job. That is not acting as a public adjuster, that's called being an entrepreneur and setting your price and your protocol and, and, and finishing the job. You can't do a job without, you can't actually build a job without having that conversation with somebody. Am I right, guys? Right on, yes. It's common sense, and, and I get it. You can't, you know, I used to have insurance claim specialists on my business card in 99, too, and there wasn't a lot of rules then. You know, you can't hold yourself off to be a public adjuster. We get it. You can't have 20% anymore on the back of your contract, especially in Texas. <laughs> uh, some states don't, don't actually uh, have the public adjusters uh, yeah. statutes. But, you know, it's, it's two different worlds, you know? And I think that you have to have a fine line. Some, of the, some folks, and you're probably one of them, Steve, and there's a team of people out there that are pushing the PA thing into a whole nother world. Meaning now we're talking about freedom of speech, that you can't have a certain conversation with a homeowner, Mrs. Smith. You know, there's 783,000 contractors in America. There's less than 20, there's less than 20,000 public, there's less than 1,000 licensed public adjusters in the state of Texas. The average claim size volume is what? Talked about this yesterday, guys. Property casualty. It's seven to ten thousand dollars the average claim size. Most claims are under ninety-five percent of uh, property claims are under fifty grand. Ninety-five percent. So when you have when you only have nine hundred public adjusters, I don't know what it is, eight eight nine hundred licensed public adjusters, state of Texas, you have four billion dollars in hail damage. Who do you think's helping Mrs. Smith at midnight with a leaky roof? Hey, she doesn't know what to do. How do I file a claim? Never done it before. The public adjuster's not there. So how do you answer to that? That's a macroeconomic issue, I know, but it's an issue. And some folks are saying, well, you can't help people file a claim. Why not? You can't get on the phone and talk to the desk adjuster about your price or what's going on. Why not? And so I don't, th I, you know, you can't say you're a public adjuster and charge fees, but some of you guys are, are starting to pass these statutes that are gray area, and you're taking a step farther saying, well, you can't even pick up the phone and support your own price as a contractor. That's nuts. It's putting contractors out of business. Right, guys? All right, let's uh, get to another question over there with All Shannon. All right, here we go. Hi, I'm Stacy. I'm from Texas, and um, I know we all agree on trying to crack down on waiving of deductibles, uh, but I'm just curious, what is the insurance industry doing to help stop the waiving of deductibles? Because we still see it ev on almost everyone we have, and I've complained to the Department of Insurance, I've told insurance carriers that we're seeing this, and I just kind of, there's just silence. Yeah, uh, this is a hot topic. We are working cooperatively with interested stakeholders in Texas. This will be addressed no later than the next legislative session in Texas in January of next year. We are scheduled a meeting with the Texas Attorney General to try to get them to change this, this stupid old AG opinion that Mr. Maddox wrote back in 73 that creates this loophole that all these guys try to use. We're going to get a new AG opinion that says you just can't do it. And if we can't get that, we will amend the statute in Texas to make it 100% clear it cannot happen and try to increase penalties. We are working on the issue, and if any contractor groups want to work with us, I welcome your involvement because it's important to all of us. Okay, so they're going to try to push for some penalties and actually to, to because when, when I've complained and I've asked them, it's just I, I get silence. I, so yeah. there's this rumor out there that I turn in 20 contractors a week to the TDI. All right, it's actually 14, okay? But most of them are for waiving of deductibles. Okay. All right, I've got a standard letter that I send into the TDI, all right? And they then just uh, write a letter to the contractor and tell them to stop, all right? That's all that can happen right now, unfortunately. We're doing all we can. Um, I think it is very interesting um, what, what Steve, you know, he's talking, what, you got to understand, you know, there are laws that restrict, and we have very, very different laws that restrict what the contractors can do and what the insurance companies can do legally and, and, and how that is done. The fact that something's a law, the fact that it may be a law that's on the books doesn't mean it's right, right? We used to have slavery, and it was wrong, and we changed it. And laws get changed by advocacy groups. And I, this group, the amount of people that are here, need to listen not just about what the law is, but about what the law 
should be. That's for, and not only that, to see how you change the law. And what's interesting is the industry does this. When they see a storm and they see things, they'll go out and they'll meet with the attorney general. And they will get an opinion about what people should be able to do and what they shouldn't be able to do. And the industry needs to do that too. And we'll, we'll talk about that later, but that's it's a very, very important thing about how laws are done. And they're meeting with the local attorney generals. We're doing that now, too, as a firm. In areas where there's these storms, we are now going and meeting with the attorney generals to tell them what we see and to get their opinions as well. So it's, it's something that you need to put a flag there uh, and remember. Let me, can I raise one issue on this? Anthony raised it as well, and, and this, it goes to your issue about changing laws. All right, Anthony's concern is that the PAs aren't interested in the $7,000 roof claim and someone needs to help the homeowner. I agree with that, all right? But the public adjuster groups are opposed to creating any exceptions to the PA licensing statute that uh, contractors can negotiate small claims. If you believe there should be a change in the law, you should work cooperatively with the PA groups, all right, to try to reach some agreement so there, maybe their licensing statutes could be amended. You could work together and create an area where contractors could have a little more freedom on small claims and PAs wouldn't need to be involved. Now my PA friends aren't gonna like me saying that and I'm not advocating for it, okay? But that's certainly a possible issue. Yeah, but we yeah, should. Yeah, and, and, and I think, and Steve, I agree very much with you um, about that. And uh, Napia had its uh, mid-year meeting at my home uh, and, and, and uh, I met with the leadership afterwards, and you're right. Hello. The PAs uh, met with the president of Appia. His main issue was joining with the industry to go after contractors who are negotiating. And I, you know, I, I'm, I'm a big supporter of Appia, and I told them that I'm supporting them 100% this year. But I told him, I don't agree with that. That's wrong. Here you have, you guys need to be focused, not against people who are on your side. You need to be focused on what are the rules and restrictions that they have. You know, and the, the, they said, well, you know what? We, we, we don't want them negotiating. We don't want them doing that. We don't want them taking advantage of the property owner. Yeah. And so I said, well, what about, the indi what about, you're a public adjuster, right? You've got licenses, there's rules, you have to have training, you've got to go through a school, you've got to get a license. In Florida, you've got a year that you have to wait as an intern to be able to help the policyholder. And, you, and Anthony's right, there's only a, f a few of them. Why is there a law that's different on the books for a public adjuster, depending upon who you represent? Why is that different? Why do we have a huge standard for a public adjuster that represents the property owner's best interest? But we don't have a standard for an independent adjuster that works adverse to the policyholder. There's no laws. That guy can get on the phone with your client, with your customer, talk about the law, talk about exclusions and policies, how, how the policy works, what they pay, what they don't pay, negotiate with them. They can do all of that. Well, they could because do that that's because, because, that, because you know what? It's the contract with our Th client. That, and that's right? right. And on the books, we're not going after, we're not creating standards for independent adjusters that should be at, at least the same for the adjuster that works on the opposite side. Those should be the same. And I added to Napia, I said, to President Napia, I said, why do you guys have high standards and the adjusters that work for them solely because they work for the insurance company don't have those standards? And the answer was, we think legislatively it's too hard to get passed. So, Actually, so, all right, so, go so, ahead. So, so one thing, no, this, is, this is what was said, and, and I agree with that. I agree with the fact that organizations like this need to know how laws are made and need to have the vision to band together to get those laws changed. It is, in my opinion, absolutely ridiculous that an independent, independent, this is a crazy name, right? Is it an independent adjuster? No, he's an adverse adjuster. It's, 
it's, it's to me mind-boggling that an adverse <laughs> adjuster just needs to have a business card and be breathing and work for an insurance company and he could negotiate with, your, with you but, and, then, and then try to negotiate with you and then try to turn around and get you in trouble for negotiating. I mean, Ooh, yeah. I, I think that's, I think that's fairly problem, insane. Man. But, that, but you know right. what? In some states, that may be the law. But the law doesn't mean it's right. And the law also doesn't mean it needs to stay the law. It stays the law if you guys don't act. That, that, and that's, I think that's an... All right, so I got it. Let me, two, three issues with that. Number one, not any Joe can be an independent adjuster. They have to get a license. All right? They work for it. In most states, yeah, there's a couple of states, but in most states, in my state, they have to be licensed. They have to associate then on that claim with an insurance company who is responsible for their conduct. And if that adjuster violates 541 of the Texas Insurance Code, they can be held personally liable. So Steve, there are Steve, standards about, of conduct where they can be held liable. Steve, what right? about when, when carriers are using MRP companies to do adjustments, correct guys? Who aren't licensed adjusters? Are you using third-party engineers to do adjustments? I've met many guys that showed up as engineers because they already knew they were going to do a denial. And they use, uh, they use ladder assist, right? I yeah. mean, ladder assists out that are adjusting claims. So how is the insurance company able to practice unlicensed adjusting, but the contractor is actually doing the work, it's being pushed down, totally can't talk. All right, don't tell the insurance industry I said this, right? but they shouldn't, right? They should not Good. do it without a license. I agree. All right? And I've told the managed repair company, all right, that I sat in a meeting with them trying to pitch my client to use them. And I said, wait, your entire business model is illegal under Texas law. And I told my client not to hire them. Okay? Because under Texas law, there's no negotiate. All right? Contractors can't negotiate. It works both ways. Can't negotiate you can't what? negotiate with us. All right? And a roofing contractor on our behalf can't negotiate. Steve, can't, can't negotiate what? That's the gray area. Yeah, what, cannot what can't negotiate the claim. What, do you, what right. does that mean? Yeah, that's right. It's, uh, <laughs> I, I went real the quickly claim. over What does North it Texas. mean to negotiate a claim? You don't need to say the word pro. What if we said insurance company can't negotiate our contract price? We're the contractor <laughs> doing the work. We understand safety, code-related issues, all that. Why does a desk adjuster, why can't we talk about our own? Right, guys? Am I right? Yeah. How do you... How do you Absolutely. build a job or build a house without talking about code, safety issues, or whoever's cutting a damn check, whether it's a bank, a property owner, insurance company, or whatnot? How, explain that to me. No, I understand the issue, and one of the issues we have with this is that most of your contracts are for the insurance proceeds, right? If in Negative. Steve Badger's world, we'd get rid of that. We'd all just write bids and competitive bidding, and we'd be that's done. A Steve, that's right? a contingency agreement. A lot of guys use insurance proceeds, but they, most of them are starting to drop a price on a build contract in a, in a, in a two-step process. Right, guys? Yeah. So once you have a build contract, and again, once it doesn't, you know, once you get a check and you're proceeding to do work, order materials of the job, how do you not you explain to me how you'd pick up a phone and talk to a desk adjuster about safety, code-related issues, shorts, things like starter and ridge, right, guys, that you need to build the job? How do you have that conversation? And, and that's, is that negotiated claim or is that a contractor talking about his project? My view, that's the latter. We will not stop a contractor from having a discussion about its estimate, all right? And they can explain the estimate, talk about the issues in the estimate, all right? I tell my uh, adjusters to be nice, all right? And, but there is a fine but line that's our, there. Steve, that's already our right as an entrepreneur. It's not like you grant us that right. Away. You guys yeah. don't grant us that right. We already have the right as American entrepreneurs, guys, discuss our price. We live in a free market economy, right? So, you just saw so, Travis Mills up here so, today. You know what I mean? The Constitution. So who says and where does it say even in a statute that we can't actually talk about our price or our scope? There are two Texas statutes, and there are statutes in 48 states uh, that have been pushed by the public adjusters. So if you're not happy about this, as soon as we're done here today, go to each of those public adjuster booths that are out there who are all trying to get your business and tell them to knock it off and to call the, the uh uh, PA uh, trade groups and tell them to lay off this issue. I read, I read, I read those statutes and negotiate claim. Okay, it can mean one thing to you guys. Talking about our price, our contract, how we build the project, safety issues, waste, starter ridge, all that kind of stuff. That's not negotiating a claim. That's negotiating how we build the job. So, so I, I, I've got a question. So we agree, though, Steve, that that you can talk to a contractor. Your your guys can talk to a contractor, and he can say, look. I'm willing to do a, pr a price for X, 
And you could say, you know what? No, we will, you need to do it for X minus 200, okay? And you agree with the general contractor on a price. You, you, that can happen, correct? It's a gray area. I prefer the way Steve Patrick talked about it yesterday in his session, was take the pricing out of it and then talk about what you're going to do. First, develop an agreed scope. But, but, I, but I can, as an entrepreneur, I can decide that if you're not giving me enough on this job to not service your person, leave them without a roof, and go to an next person. I have that right, don't I? So of course. Okay. So if you hire an expert, another expert adjusting firm, uh, and and we go back and forth on what we think the price and scope should be, and we have an agreement, that can happen, correct? Sure. Who's, okay. who, are, who are you in that example? Uh, in, in this case, in this case, the contractor. Okay. Uh, if everyone's getting along and being nice, I have no problem with that. Okay. And so, once that's agreed upon, your guys agreed with the general contractor for a certain price, Should, you, should both sides do what they say? Should both sides do what yeah. they say? Should they both honor that agreement? Once you agree to the amount, shouldn't they honor that agreement? Yeah, not necessarily. Oh! All right. Whoa, 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 wait. You could, okay, so not necessarily. So what you're saying is, what you're saying is, I can agree with the general contractor on a price, go back and forth on price and scope and say, okay, we agree. Then the roofer can start and then the insurance company doesn't have to live up to that agreement. Correct? So what I get are situations where there's information included within what is represented to me on the front side that when the project is done, is not uh, then does not turn out to be true all right so i hedge here because i have situations where what we believe is happening based on what is represented to us in information that's submitted in support of the claim when we do a little investigation it is not accurate all right so that is why i say that not necessarily okay we have to look on the backside then to see what work was done what right. authority? What, what, here, here, what, here what is authority what, here's what I see. Here's what. Here's real what, quick, John. Real quick. What, what authority gives you or a carrier any authority that with that that a contractor would have to send in subcontractor invoices? Where, where, what authority is that? Uh, my contract with my insured. All right. That says that I insured. only owe. All right. The reasonable cost of repair with like kind and quality. But, but if all you right. agree, that that if you agree as to, do, to what the what, cost what, is, how, what authority do you have to 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 an indie, to a contractor which you don't have a contract with? I don't. To request, I know a lot of them just send it in because they don't know any better. I never used to send them in. Yeah. But what authority? And, and if I did, I whited out the price because none of your damn business, <laughs> right, guys? It's proprietary information. It's proprietary information. Joseph, how much you paying your guys over there? Before I pay you tomorrow, make sure you send me a a, a, a breakdown of your labor. So you know what I mean? That's not the way things work. Yeah, so I'm trying to help the policyholder just like you are, all right? And uh, what I will do in that situation uh, is I'll send my... We have to tell the I'll truth. send my policyholder a letter that says, we want to resolve this claim, we want to come to a fair price, but your contractor is not providing the reasonable information that you are required to submit under your contract with us, right? The, the homeowner is required to submit Documents and information and invoices of completed work, but not that in entrepreneur's proprietary information. Yeah. Right, guys? It doesn't say that anywhere. They trick us into thinking we have to send it in. You do not have to send in your subcontractor invoices. You can yeah. fi send in your final invoice, and if it's fair market pricing, insurance companies should pay the damn bill, especially if it's on Xactimate, correct? Well, here's what I find with the Xactimate, and, and with exactly what we're talking about, what I see is starting to happen now, as maybe a reaction to, to this. That what the insurers are doing is they're going back and forth with you on the price. They are negotiating with you. Their people are negotiating with you. Make no mistake. You can say it however you want it, but they're saying, we'll pay this much, and we won't pay that much, and you get to decide whether you take the job or not. 
and they get you to take the job and you st and the, but but very often what they'll say is I can't pay you your basic estimate. We need to see it in Xactimate. You got to back it into Xactimate. And so we now for the for the for the JGC you're you're important. You're looking at all your costs. You're thinking about all the costs it's taking you to get there. All the jobs you didn't get all the labor that you didn't, all the people that didn't pay, all of those things, and you're factoring in what your opportunity is for the neighbor to do the neighbor's roof or the neighbor's neighbor's roof, and you're deciding whether to take that job or not. So you take that job, and you agree on that price, and they say, well, you got to put it into an Xactimate to back it into Xactimate. So then they back it into Xactimate. It's the same number, and they back it in there, and I show a 10 and 10. And then what they'll do is, after they agree with you on the price, they will then do what Steve is saying that they're doing. They're going to go to your, to, your, to your customer, and they're going to say, they're charging you too much for this roof, and we can now get it cheaper. That's what they're doing. And they're contacting, like, like you said, they're contacting your subs, and despite the fact that they agreed on what the price and scope was, and you agreed, and you did the job based upon that agreement, they're now going back dooring you and trying to find out what your profit is. Okay. Now the question is, but we agree, we agree on what they're doing. Now, one, a very similar situation, I was consulted with another attorney that has this claim. Very similar situation. Exa actually, exactly the same situation. And they contact the subs. And then they, the insurer made the accusation that the policyholder didn't have a contract anymore. It was void because there was negotiation. You were acting like a public adjuster and trying to, and trying to void the contract. This is happening. Now it's the it's it's the it's the it's the it's the, it's the insurance company that's that's negotiating this with you. John, it's a, gray, it's, a gray, it's a gray area, guys. I I'd, I'd like to know exactly what you what you Steve you believe a contractor could say on the phone, verbatim. Yeah, I'm not going to give you a verbatim. And I don't, believe, I don't believe the stat, I don't believe I, the statute I, actually says you can't talk about your price. You guys use the word negotiate a claim. That doesn't mean you can't negotiate your price as an entrepreneur. You guys believe that, and a lot of you guys are starting to push that. That basically muffles the entrepreneur as a gig order. It goes against pretty much every, every premise of our, of our free market economy where we, we base price on the laws of supply and demand, right, guys? The fact, right, Hua? The fact, that, the fact that we're buying into the fixed price system is what it is, which isn't capitalism, by the way. The fact that we're buying into it and trying to appease the insurance company to make the job smoother, most of you guys use Xactimate, right? So we're using it, we just use it correctly, <laughs> right? Because if one guy uses it, another guy uses it, it's Xactimate, it's Xactimate, it's line items. Some people know how to use it correctly, some people don't. And there's also another situation amongst carriers, about the, the top 20, that they're colluding, they're copying each other's, their, their, their policies are starting to copy each other on endorsements. It's almost like they're having, I don't know if they're having meetings, but I'm sure they're watching each other. They, they, the starter and ridge, how many guys have the starter and ridge problem? Little silly things, right? Millions of tens of millions of dollars at the end of the year that, that they're saving for that, that little deal. But it's happening across the same 15, 20 carriers, and it's, you could call it a monopolistic behavior, you could call it an oligopoly, you could call it collusion. I mean, I know you're exposing fraud on contractors, but believe me, when this thing takes off, some of these carriers are gonna have some exposure, not just with contractors, but property owners you know, nationwide. And so, you know, it's, I just think there to needs that? to be. I think there just needs to be clarity. I think we agreed on that. Absolutely. There's got to be clarity, and and we can we can debate what the laws should be, whether they're good laws or not. But we should have clarity, and I think we should be upfront and truthful. You know about who's on whose side. You know uh, whether their the carrier is truly on the policyholder side or not. Um, and and I and I think and I think we we should also agree. We also agree on, on some slides that, you know, there's profit on both sides, all right? Profit on both sides of this stage. We, we represent different, different people and, and different sides of it. Uh, but the laws, need to be, the laws need to be even, and they need to be clear, and we shouldn't, 
I don't think we should take advantage of ambiguity in how the system works uh, to the disadvantage. You shouldn't take advantage we of the contract. We should be contractors. truthful and agree and, and, and live up with what we agree on and not have gotcha provisions in there. Does anybody here feel like they need a, a law degree to build a roof these days? <laughs> <laughs> right? So there's, right. A lot of, there's a lot of finger pointing on the, on the contractors, guys. And, you know, some of it's legit, but a lot of it, this gray area stuff, you know, it's, it's, it's pushing too far away. It's too many people pointing at the contractor. Guess what? The contractor's rebuilding the house, right? Who's really making a property owner whole again? You guys in this room. And that's, at, the end of the, at the end of the day, we all talk about all these semantics and who's right and who's wrong. At the end of the day, Mrs. Smith needs to get her roof on, correct? Who? Yeah. Huh? And, and after these hurricanes, you got all these claims and stuff. It's, it's you guys that are rebuilding them. You guys are the ones remaking the customer hole. And I think in all these conversations, you say, listen to this, everybody's forgetting about Mrs. Smith. She's not getting the public adjuster attention. She can't afford an attorney. Guess who's helping her out? The entrepreneur, the, the local roofer, because he understands what's going on. And, and to stifle that speech is, is keeping not only, is, is now you have an uneducated property owner. You know, I'm not talking about negotiating a claim or acting as a lawyer of public justice. I'm just talking about being an entrepreneur. And, and, and basic freedom of speech and, and your price. I don't think there's actually a statute, I read the statutes, that says you can't negotiate your price. I don't think it says that. It says uh, negotiate a claim, acting as a public adjuster, yada, yada. Now they got people thinking you can't actually call and support your own damn price as an entrepreneur. That's nuts. And I don't think if you actually read the black and white that it says that. And if it does, that, that needs to be changed. Hua? Let's get to a few questions. All right, sorry guys. Um, you, Steve, you opened your um, speech and you said that the insurance, that you train your adjusters to be reasonable. And so my question to you is, there's an adjuster that's sitting on the other line and all of us in here have friends that are adjusters and before storm, they're given strict instructions. We do not pay O and P. And there are friends back outside of work and they say, this is just what the carrier's telling us, don't pay it. So then we call in, and it is reasonable for us to request O&P. But your statement was that the insurance companies want to do what's reasonable. So why is it that you just doesn't pay it when it is reasonable, instead of making us do unreasonable things to make you do what you should have done reasonably in the first place? I agree. You know what? There is not a thing that he said that I disagree with. Right? If a carrier takes a blanket position that they are never going to pay general contract or overhead and profit, that's wrong. It's wrong. It's not the standard, at least in my state, it's not the standard. All right, so there's lots of good lawyers here. Give them a call if you're aware of carriers who are taking that position because it is inconsistent with the law of Texas. I put it up there, Merlin Firm agrees with it. That we're using that standard now. Okay, so I agree with that. All right, awesome, let's move on so we can get everybody heard. So I think what you guys gotta understand is this industry's come full circle. So what Steve Badger is seeing right here is that eventually, when you said early, somebody got greedy. That's a two-way street. Yep. All so right. when you see the pushback in here, that's a direct reflection of what's going on in the industry. I've been in this industry for 29 years, going on 30 years, as a commercial contractor, as a public adjuster, and you speak at industry conferences like PLRB, correct? All the time. And you teach adjusters that if they're getting pushed back from a contractor or a public adjuster, you can assist them in ghostwriting a letter, writing however that may look, um, and also preparing a thing called a soft denial. Am I correct? Uh, I'm familiar with that term. It's coming. Well, what, what is, what is that, what is that term? Let's, let's see, what is that term? So let's call it like it is. The real picture, the real picture here, is as a big contractor, as you get smarter and your horns come out of the grass, you become a target. And there's guys like Steve Badger, called like it is, who stand behind the insurance companies, and their sales pitch is, if you have a problem, come to me, I'll take care of that contractor, I'll take care of that public adjuster, I will line up a team of experts, uh, engineers, uh, not real engineers, Let's, they're always the same guys. They're not guys from the industry yep. who actually build commercial buildings right. and work for Turner or Swingerton, and I can go on oh, and on. Oh, are those the guys you're hiring? Those I don't the see them. I see the those, guys no. who write nothing but reports 
for the industry, your industry all the time, never do causation analysis, and just throw in numbers. Not my engineers. Yeah. And that would be okay. wrong, right? That I'm would be the roofer. PAs and the lawyers, right. But, but that, would be, that would be wrong for either side to do that. Yes, I agree. I agree to things you said yesterday. We you know. shouldn't be altering reports. Of course and not. And an engineering company does that. It's wrong. And, and the insurance company shouldn't promote that, right? Nobody should be changing reports. Yes, yeah. Yeah. I agree and with so that. And your so fir your first, the, the interesting, your first, one of your first slides that was interesting is the, what the hell is going on. <laughs> um, and the, when I, I looked at the slide uh, there, you had an ad for Rimkiss. You guys know Rimkiss? We're going to talk about Remkis. Yeah, you, you had, I just thought that was ironic. I didn't have an ad. They ran an ad okay. on the side o of that On screen. that site that you right. were writing on, there was the ad in the photo of your thing, of Remkis. Well, if you listen to my breakout session, I talked about guys from Remkis and the forging of the engineering reports by the insurance industry. Nobody should do that. You put what the hell is going on. And uh, Steve, I think, you're, uh, I think your, your question, is, your, your, your comment was very, very apt because you're saying that this is also a reaction. This is a reaction of what happens. And one of the things I thought was interesting about the presentation, in the beginning of the presentation, was that you said, um, you know, this is about contractor, this is about profits for the insurance company versus profit for the contractors. And, and I thought that there is an economic tension, but the economic tension is, is for the policyholder. Okay? And, and you, you use an example in there about the soft, you only had a certain amount of claims and the insurance industry is realizing that there are people in organizations like this that are actually using science to determine hail damage, which before didn't, you know, there, there, wasn't, there wasn't that. You had to actually, people actually had to get up on a roof to see if they had it. Now we're actually using science and you mentioned that the complaints are going down, Texas, but the lawsuits are going up. But understand what's going on here is I, I kind of feel like it's the advocates for the policyholders um, that, that are becoming the targets here and not advocacy for the policyholder to do the right thing. And the fact that the industries like this are using science to determine what the actual damage is to property, I don't see it as a bad thing, I did will I, tell you. What did I say? I don't see it as a bad thing either Good. because if they have damage, they should be paid. Good. We agree. I understand that. But that ch when the number of claims changes, goes up 84%, that changes the actuarial models, it right? So there are going to be changes in, on my side when the number of claims increases so dramatically. Yes, of course, the number of claims. Because it's not that the damage necessarily has been changing. It's the number of claims that have... Well, here, okay, let's be... Everybody with metal roofs in the hail zone... All right, lots of people, they'd have a hail event, they'd look at their metal roof, and they said, you know what, it's got little minor dents, who cares, all right? And that's how most homeowners react, or business owners reacted for a long time, okay, until all the contractors started getting on Google Earth and identifying all the metal roofs, and then they'd knock on the door and say, hey, we see from Google Earth you have a metal roof, all right? And I can get you a metal roof because we call that physical loss or damage, all right? That has changed the model. So the insurance industry is responding to try to bring it back to, you know what, a metal roof with ma very minor dents is not going to rust out and leak, all right, and therefore we don't cover it. And that's where we disagree. Question, that's guys. where we very much disagree because you started by saying, and the first part of what you said I agree with, Steve, very much. Okay. You said, the first part of it was, and it's like this the shell game that the guy plays, right? <laughs> the first part was the insurance company wants, when they, when they make how much the policy costs, they want to look at the actuarial tables to see what the risk is, all right? Determine what the actual damage is going to be. And if science comes out and shows that things are damaged, then, then, then we made it change that model. But then you said, that's not the reaction and the solution. I, we agree, that should be the solution. Because here's what happens. The co-owner who's in it right now, who has dents on his roof, who may not have insurance or may not be able to get the coverage because the carrier denies it, may have to live with it because they don't have the money. But the next time he goes to sell the property, I guarantee you that somebody's going to inspect that house, inspect that building, and if it does have dents from hail, and if it does have improperly a uh, fixed problem, then that policyholder suffers a loss. 
And you agreed, Ooh. you agreed, based upon your premiums, Ooh, yes. to pay the loss. And if you agree to pay the loss, you should pay the loss. Now, if it's too no, much, wait a minute. if it's I too agree. much. That homeowner should have bought a policy that didn't have a cosmetic damage endorsement. All right? I'm sorry. All right? So, but they want a cheap policy. The, they want to save money. All right? So I know, we got to answer more questions. I know. Okay. We got a question over here. Hi, thank you, gentlemen, and enjoying your debate. Um, question back to uh, the one with the gentleman before me. Um, I understand that we will never understand the actual uh, recipe for actuarial recipe, if you will, for the <laughs> O and P makeup. But being that O and P should be included in that recipe, how do you come to a true actual ACV value? in the initial estimate or a correct initial estimate without it being represented on paper. Yeah, so as I said, if the involvement of a general contractor is reasonably necessary, all right, that should be included in determining the ACV calculation. All right, there is nothing that TDI has never said you have to include it in every claim no matter what. That what they said was if it's properly includable, it should not be excluded. Yeah. All right, next question. Hey. Kurt Cobb the lawless swamp of Louisiana. Good to meet all of you guys. So here's, here's the thing. I'm trying to look at this objectively. And how many of us have ever had a car wreck and the insurance company paid for our car to get fixed? Is that pretty common? Well, how many of us have tried to settle with the person because we didn't want it to go to insurance company? Anybody ever done that? So this happened to me recently and I ended up getting the, the bill uh, from whoever it was that was going to pay for this. My first question was like, how did they get that, that price? So it made me feel like, well, since I'm having to pay for this, I want, a, I, I want to see how you came to that number. So it is reasonable for the insurance companies to say, how are you getting here? And if I'm paying for this, it needs to be done. But the problem is, is I've got, a, I've got another claim that's seven or eight trades. Liberty refuses to pay overhead and profit. And then when you get them there, then they say, we'll pay for O&P except for on the roof. Does that ever happen? So, so, and I know that we've addressed this, but I don't feel like I've actually got an answer. So the question is, what you've said, it's wrong, but what do we do? What's the solution? Where, what do we actually do? Because we're put in this situation where we have to sue. We have to do things because it's not being done right. What would you say the solution is? All right, so if you're fighting about just OMP, that's the only issue, whether it's reasonably necessary, all right? Then the homeowner in that situation, okay, could demand appraisal. And you could go to appraisal strictly on the issue of general contractor overhead and profit and let the appraisal panel resolve that. Now, please don't demand appraisal yourself, all right? Have the homeowner do that, okay? That's, that is an avenue to, uh, to resolve those disputes all right, without litigation, all right? Because I recognize there, there is a gray area as to what is reasonably likely. I get that. Yeah. Question over here. Hello, this is Steve Patrick. Um, I have a question for you, Steve. Uh, earlier you mentioned that it's wrong for us to waive deductibles, and I agree with that. It is wrong for us to waive deductibles. Contractors should not be eating deductibles. But then with the new MRPs, the insurance companies are now waiving the deductibles. If you use the MRP, they're doing the very things that you're saying that contractors shouldn't do, and that's an unfair, that's an unlevel playing field. Yeah, so I understand, uh, and this issue has come up, all right, and the difference when you have a contractor who is governed by the statute, no waiving a deductible statute, difference is when you have an insurance company and a building owner, all right, that is a contract between them, all right, and it calls for a deductible, all right, if the insurance company chooses not to enforce that contractual provision, that is within their right, all right, and that is the argument they are using in the, under the manager repair programs not to, uh, uh, enforce a deductible. For the endorsements that I'm writing for my clients, we're actually writing it as a uh, right to repair endorsement where the parties can agree and we do write into there that uh, in exchange for this, we would not collect a uh, deductible. Yeah, so I and agree that's better, but that's the argument they're making. And that's what creates an unlevel playing field. Yeah. yeah. All right, next question. Thank you for coming, by the way, and that takes, uh, that takes some uh, cojones to do that. And, Thank uh, you for having me. I appreciate yeah. it. Yeah. Thank you.
So I'd, I'd, I'd like you to clarify something. You were talking about the, the Whitestone case earlier, that it was an initial agreement of $1.7 million? Yes. Okay. And then, then on the back end, the contractor came out at $2.4 million, and it went to you, I guess. I, I, I it wasn't that. my case. Okay. I wish it was, but okay. it was not. But, yeah. but, but anyways, it's a landmark case, and then, am I correct? And it said it ended up wanting to know what the actual cost is, and, and that's how it came down to $864,000? Yeah, okay. yeah, that's so, what happened. So my question in that is, how does that ever happen? If, if it was agreed at $1.7 million, exactly. that's indemnification that's agreed to on both parties. That's a legal contract right there. The handshake, the signing. So how does that go to $864,000? That's criminal on the insurance industry's part. And just off the record, someday I look forward to being deposed by you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, <laughs> So pull, send me an email and I'll send you the case. All right, it's a classic example of a contractor getting greedy and the federal judge looked at it uh, and the federal judge said, you know what, this guy's not a real contractor. All right, he's not a real general contractor, he's a paper contractor. He's a salesman who calls himself a general contractor. All right, and unlike his specious numbers that he came up with, and that's the federal court's uh, language, the real amount actually spent is what the, the real roofing contractor, CEI, which assumed they could do the job and still make a reasonable profit. This is why I'm about bids, guys, okay? We are in agreement. Let's get bids when we, when we have this exactimate issue. Yeah. We have one last question. All right, question. hold on really quick. Um, we're going to be ending this session at 1210, so if we can like, make sure everybody gets heard. Like, All right, speak I'll, I'll answer really quickly from now on. So the question is, if, if it's illegal for contractors to negotiate claims, uh, then what are you doing as far as reporting to the TDI for the insurance adjusters trying to solicit that illegal activity when negotiating claims, are you reporting the insurance adjusters? Second question is, when the insurance company pays something that's, that's say they pay $1,000 where the claim should be 10000 or they pay a $10,000 claim when it should be 100000 what are you reporting to the TDI where the insurance company is trying to defraud the insured or are you just being hypocritical uh, and not reporting those guys? <laughs> so let me tell you that. When companies come to me, all right, after they've been sued or they've received a demand, all right, I will actually, all right, unlike some of the policyholder attorneys who send demand letters to me, I actually look at the file and I analyze it, all right, and I look at what was done by my company and what was paid and what wasn't paid. And in a lot of matters, I tell my clients, you underpaid, you should have paid this matter, and we go pay those claims, all right? But what I get from the other side, thanks, we do. But what I often get from the other side are demand letters with no investigation at all, none, all right? And so I'll answer it that way. The second, your first question was? Um, well, it's the adjusters negotiating with right, the, right. the contractors. Again, guys, we can beat this to death, right? There's a gray area here. So I tell my adjusters to be nice, all right, and work with the contractor. Right. What, what I'm saying is if you're turning in contractors to the TDI for, for unlicensed practice of public adjusting, then are you also turning in the adjuster that was negotiating with them for yeah, soliciting that illegal activity? Well, or are so you being now a hypocrite? you make a jump to soliciting them to do that, okay? Well, it's, it's, soliciting a, it's soliciting an illegal activity. And then, and then what are you doing about the, the, the insurance companies, when they offer $10,000 on a $100,000 claim, they're trying to defraud someone. That is insurance fraud. There and are, are you actually turning them into the TDI it's actually or not, are you it, being a hypocrite? It's not insurance fraud, okay, but it is a bad faith business practice that is regulated by the statutes and there's lots of good lawyers who will turn them in or go after them, all right, and file lawsuits against insurance companies, all right? When, as I said, if I'm aware of my clients not paying claims that we believe should have been uh, paid, we will tell them to do that, okay? Yeah. So uh, now we know why there's so many more in litigation because he's just telling it's us, the, take what it came to first. That's right, what came first? How is it that the insurance companies can set up policies when you say they want to pay fair and what's reasonable, we go through an exactimate and we put in our starter, we put in our ridge. Um, heck, the starter's already on the roof and they say, we don't pay it. How about step flashings, chimney flashings? You know, those are the critical points on a roof that are gonna leak and they yeah. say, we don't pay it. When you total a car, they don't say the wheels and tires are good, keep them, we're gonna replace the car. Why is it we're not getting a full roof replacement 
such as events with State yeah, Farm. Yeah, so, you know, and I can't speak to all the individual situations, but I will always say this to my clients, all right? If to put a code-compliant roof, all right, that is compliant with the codes and manufacturer requirements, all right, you should pay for that. All right, so Steve Patrick mentioned this yesterday also. All right, it was a great class. I we got it, it on tape. He said, support your positions. <laughs> What's that? I'm sorry. I said, we got it on video. Yeah, he said, support your positions so with, with code and manufacturers. All right, that's what you should do. But we do that, and now you say we are negotiating, acting as a public adjuster, and you yeah. want to throw us to the wolves. Guys, again, all right, this issue, talk to your PA friends out there. All right. What do you think? I know you're saying it's a PA, it's a PA, it's a PA. What do you think about yeah, this? Yeah, so I think, all right, I'll keep coming back to, there is a gray area where we should work cooperatively all right, and work together. So, but, when so you start, but when you start going to my adjuster and saying, I'm going to sue you for bad faith, all right, or I've got no lawyer friends, or you actually do completely negotiate the claim, you take over the process from the homeowner entirely. I think that's too much. Okay, so, so what do you think that they can do? And they can't do. I mean, so you keep saying uh, the public adjusters are after you. The public adjusters are after you. The public adjusters are after you. Yeah. The insurance companies are not, I guess. But the public adjusters are after you. What do you think? Is, should, do you think that uh, uh, how should it work? They Let's should. See. They so can I, explain their estimate. Okay. They can answer any questions that the adjuster has. All right. Uh, and do that in the presence of your insured. All right. If you can. All right. Do it together as a collaborative effort. All right. You can't though take over the claim process. Okay, and, and, if right. the and if they agree, the insurance company should honor that. Uh, Next question. I, I'm, I'm not going there again. All right. Okay, so mine has to do with, uh, it's in Florida, and in like, it's more of towards, like, geared towards the AOB. So you show up to a house. Um, it's an insurance claim. Uh, the homeowner does not want you to help them with the insurance claim. They don't want uh, you to do an AOB, so you just give them a regular estimate, all right? They get three estimates. They send over the three estimates. Then the insurance company calls you. And they say, okay, we got three estimates here for Mr. Smith. Um, we want to know why this is this. So you say, okay, this is why this is. Okay, well, you know what? That does sound reasonable. We're going to go ahead and grant your estimate for them to use your estimate. So he says, okay, go ahead and notify the homeowner. We'll do the same. So you, hold, you, so you notify the homeowner and say, hey, great news. We can do the roof for you. They have agreed to the price. So the homeowner says, well, I got a high deductible. You say, well, the price has already been agreed upon. We can't, that's the price, that's the price. There's nothing we can do about it. Well, I got a bid for somebody who can do it for lower. So guess what? We don't get that job. So we didn't get the AOB, but we didn't get the job. So what, so what do you do in that scenario? Because, I mean, somehow the homeowner should be held account, like responsible. Yeah, so you have to tell your homeowner on the front end, hey, we're going to do this, but you have to pay your damn deductible. Well, I went right? back. And, well, I I know, went. and I know you lose jobs to the homeowner or the deductible waivers, and you guys all hate it. And let's work together to fix that problem. Well, I, I went back to the solution. I went back to the insurance company. I called them and said, "Hey, just so you know, the insurance company, uh, this homeowner is going to use another contractor. You know, I've already I got the, we have the price of ten thousand. They're going to hire somebody to do it for seven. So there's got to be something that you guys can do because that's that's not right. I'm doing what I can, guys. I truly am focused on this issue. Yeah, and I I'm, I am sympathetic to that position because good contractors call me all the time saying, Badger, we're sick of losing jobs." to these uh, deductible waivers, and we're trying to fix that. All right, next question. Yes, I've been down in uh, Texas working Hurricane Harvey. I've looked at several hundred insurance reports, and probably 95% of them are fraudulently short. I don't see any adjusters going to jail like that guy that was on the screen, so I think the fraud should be executed on both sides. Well, together, there's lots of capable lawyers to help in that situation. I'm hoping my clients are writing proper estimates. Yeah. I'm also going to send you a memo when I get back to Texas from the Texas Department of Insurance that says OMP is owed on every single claim. Guys, I've seen it a hundred times, okay? I call it's them not and ask what them what it says. Real. I call no. them and ask them, is this a real memo? And they said yes. <clears throat> yes. Is there a memo that comes after that? And they said no. There's two TDI bulletins, all right? And they say, and the intent of it is when it's properly payable, all right, then it must be included. All right, you can't just exclude it as an item that's only a replacement cost item. All right, uh, the law is real clear on that. Next yeah. question. Hi, Joe Bremberg with Smart Roof. 
Uh, I have a question for you, Steve, and I, I do respect how calm and collected you are. You, are, you must be a lawyer or something. Uh, so my question is this, does the policyholder, and may, maybe I'm wrong on this and this was a stupid question, but I Googled it and it came up as, does the policyholder have the right to choose whichever provider he or she chooses to? And the answer was yes, right? Whichever provider, that's their right, correct? Absent a policy provision that creates a managed repair situation, yes. Okay, fantastic. So. Are you aware of the retail market in roofing? Do you know who the largest retail roofer is in the United States? I don't. That's Power Home Remodeling Group. Do you know how much they did in revenue last year? I'm assuming no, since you're not familiar with them. Over half a billion. Okay. So do you know what their average cost per square foot is? And they will not drop below their floor, no matter the deal, it does not matter. They will not drop below $9 a square foot. They will not drop below $9 a square foot. So if Mr. and Mrs. Homeowner who has a relationship with power, right? They love power. They've got, you know, Joe over at power, he's the best. I'm gonna use power. And they say, here's power's estimate. Their price is non-negotiable because they're a half a billion dollar company. What does the insurance company do? Yeah, yeah so we owe the reasonable cost to repair with like kind and quality. Exactly. Uh, yeah, and uh, so I understand the argument you're making. Okay, okay. And it's a good one, but our position will be. All right, that, that it's we owe the reasonable cost. Okay, right. so is nine dollars a square foot unreasonable to deal with the largest and best roofing company that that customer deserves? Right. So what's good? Uh, and I understand the argument. Okay, sure. but I don't have an answer other than that. Okay. Right. Now, so did I stump him? One, one other issue on this, though. Okay. So there's a discussion about right after a storm and prices go up. All right. I'm sympathetic to that. I understand that, and Xactimate is behind on it. All right, we had dealt with this situation in San Antonio after the 2016 storms, and I told my clients, labor's higher, all right? So demonstrate labor's higher, okay? Uh, and if there is an issue and it cannot be addressed, go to appraisal, all right? I'm sympathetic to that issue. Yeah. What, what side are we on? Hi. Um, so... I just want to, before I ask my question, I just want to ask, what's your definition of actual cash value um, indemnity? What, what you define as actual cash value? Yeah, depreciated value of the property. Okay. And, well, that's using replacement costs, but like, what, what does it actually mean? Like, what is the actual cash value loss? Age and condition. But what I mean is, is it the actual loss of the physical item that was that was damaged, that was lost. Well, I'm trying to determine the actual cash value of a roof. So if I've got a uh, you know, three-tab shingle with a 25-year warranty, and it's you know, 13 years old, all right, and it's in modest condition, then I think a 50% depreciation to determine actual cash value would be reasonable. I typically do not depreciate roofs more than 50% if that roof is performing its intended function, no matter how old it is. Okay, the reason why I ask is um, overhead and uh, not to beat a dead horse, but overhead and profit. Um, so when you're talking about a retail price, say for example, water spills on a TV and insurance replaces it. Within that retail cost is the is the labor and material and the profit of the all the companies and all the chain of distribution to get that TV into your home. When a contractor builds your house 10, 12, 15, 30 years ago, and builds that house and builds that roof. That, that was labor material and the overhead and profit of the subcontractors and the general contractors that were on that house. So how is it that in theory, overhead and profit shouldn't be included on every single claim when it is actually incurred upon installation originally? Because I owe the replacement value, the cost to replace the roof. We're not looking at the old cost. And you don't want me to look at the old cost because that roof cost probably four bucks a square when it was installed. So I'm looking at the replacement value of that roof and whether or not overhead and profit is owed. Right, but you're also trying to find an actual cash value. Um, and if, if, it's, if the involvement of a general contractor is reasonably necessary and that 10 buck a square foot built up goes to 12 because of that, I would depreciate based on the $12 a square foot. And if it's a 50% uh, depreciation, I'd depreciate it from 12 bucks a square foot, inclusive of GC and OMP, to six. Yeah. Hey, Steve. Um, why does mutual insurance companies pay differently from a, a standard carrier like State Farm? I'm not aware of any reason they would. Uh, that you're saying, do they pay more or less? What's they your pay, experience? They pay a lot less. And they I, say, don't, oh, this I don't is know why pay. my mutual insurance company clients are held to no different standard than any other company. 
I well, don't know why that would be the case. Okay, another question. Why do the insurance companies get to manipulate Xactimate and put in their own prices? Yeah, so Xactimate is the program that is used. I get that. All right, I understand. Um, and that's just what we have. Um, I understand. Um, you've told, already told you my views on it. One, real quick, one issue that I'm really, we haven't discussed is supplements. Can I, we have one minute on supplement and then we'll do these last couple questions. All right, every contractor who identifies something during the claim process, all right, that was not included in an initial estimate, has a right to submit a supplement. And that should be done through the homeowner, okay? I agree with that, all right, and that absolutely supplements are warranted. But I know some of you here know that I have a concern with companies, all right, who are strangers to the contract and all they do is supplements and take a contingency fee based on the increase in claim value. That bothers me, okay? And that's an issue that we're gonna be arguing about in the next couple of years, yeah. Uh, my name is Donald and I have a question about final invoicing. About what? S final invoicing. Okay. So I've had several homeowners where when you send a final invoice, the insurance company says, you know, you need to send in the actual cost of what you feel is reasonable. And then I've had other homeowners that say, well, we don't need to pay you that, we're just going to pay you what, you know, we think is fair. So for instance, I had one where a homeowner had a claim and it was $10,000 I filed, supplemented, got it to like 13 grand. They didn't pay the extra three grand. So I called the insurance company, the insurance company said, well, your final invoice did say 13. And I said, exactly, so can you talk to the homeowner and let them know they owe us the money? And they said, no, the final invoice is how much you feel as a contractor that it's worth, but we can't enforce if the homeowner pays you that. So my thing is, is, is a final invoice the actual cost that you charge the homeowner, or is the final invoice what you feel is fair? Because that is a huge loophole where you could say, well, yeah, your estimate of 100 grand, that's, that's fair, but I'll, I'll do it for 80. And then the insurance company says, no problem. So how, how does that work? I'm, I'm sympathetic to your position. I understand it. Um, and uh, that's an issue between you and the homeowner. That's so, not my issue. So um, you're okay with me sending a final invoice for the full amount of RCV, if it's uh, 13 grand. You're okay with me going to the homeowner and saying, I'll charge you 10, and that's okay. Well, no, wait a minute. Uh, who's making three grand off my client that didn't get well, used? Well, the homeowner just did, because they're not going to yeah. give me the other three grand. Yeah, so, so, that, so there are some interesting issues there, and that comes up on a regular basis. I understand it. There's issues so between me answer? and my homeowner. I don't have an answer for it because I don't. I'd have to go through the entire hypothetical and the facts and and why they're not paying. If well, no. there's some issues. My question is, are you enforcing the final invoice? Am I are what? You, are you going to make sure that I get paid my money? It's not my obligation so not. as an insurance company to make sure you get paid in your agreement with your homeowner because that's one of the problems we have. We got two contracts here, right? We got the insurance company insured contract, and we got the homeowner uh, contractor contract, and so, they kind of bleed over. And I can't address necessarily as an so insurance is, so company is it that. Illegal? So is it illegal for me to send a final invoice for 13 and charge the homeowner 10? <laughs> um, if you're charging the homeowner 10 and you're sending an invoice because for 13, because that's what I think is reasonable. Yeah, I see that is what the deductible 10. waivers do. All right, to encompass or to uh, address the deductible issue. No, I'll, I'll, right. I'll get the deductible, but I don't want to charge them three grand of the other stuff that, you know, starter. I'm not going to charge for starter. Yeah, that's an issue. Yeah. So. Yes. Hi. Um, yeah. I, I don't have an answer. No, I think you should it. answer. I think, I'm not I think dodging should, it. I, I just there's, there's no, but no I think, answer. No, but it is a, it's a serious question, yeah. Steve. It's a very serious question. I think, I think it does deserve an answer. I I've do, I do. What I can. I, because yeah. is it illegal? Like, will you try to put somebody in jail for it in this room? Let's, let's, let's tell them, if they do that, do you consider that to be criminal insurance fraud, and will you turn them in? Let's answer. What, what well, do you think? Well, I, I can't. In some situations, we have. All right? I've, if I'm aware of a contractor, all right, who is submitting invoices, all right, for $13,000 and only charging the homeowner ten. dollars all right, and not giving me the same invoice that they've given to the homeowner, all right, that is insurance fraud. Yes, if they're giving us different invoices. All right, I agree with that is insurance fraud in that situation. But I can't make a broader statement, but in that situation, you can't create two invoices. All right, that is wrong. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, do you remember the scenario I spoke about how if, you know, I gave the homeowner a contract, insurance approved it, and they went with a different contractor for less? What? I don't think I asked my question. My question was, is there anything that you guys are doing to enforce, um, because basically that now that homeowner is, is profiting, okay? Because if, if, if 
our contract was for 10 and they went ahead and hired somebody for seven. Yeah, you know, so it, I, okay, and I'm sorry. I am, I am, so that's similar to this issue, right? Because if $10,000 was approved as an ACV payment mm -hmm. and they went and got someone else to do it for seven, all right? All right, and then they come back to me with a replacement cost uh, estimate or number of 13, right? Then that's wrong. That's insurance fraud. They cannot do that. There is nothing I can do, though, to enforce your contract with the building owner. I can't help you with that situation. All right, well, the because I spoke with the insurance company that day, and they said that they don't have to send in the other estimate. They said once they release the money, they have now done their due diligence on the claim. They have released whatever money. So they, you know, are, are, even though they agreed that this roof's gonna be done at 10, um, they've, once they release that 10, whatever the homeowner does, they could do it for, they could do it, get somebody to do it for five, and now they're profiting $5,000. Yeah. So with respect to an ACV number, there is some truth to that, okay? Uh, there is some truth. Once I make my ACV payment, I owe that regardless, okay? Regardless of what is spent. So that in hypothetical, uh, the, the Whitestone case, when it ended up being only 800,000 and the insurance company had paid 1.2, all right, there's a legitimate issue. Maybe the homeowner gets to keep that and the insurance company doesn't get it back. All right, but as soon as they come back for an RCV holdback number, all right, and that money wasn't spent, then there's a problem. All right, this is the last question over here. All right, Steve, my name's Brian. Um, I'm just a homeowner and I got a policy and I got a loss. So your insurance companies want to indemnify me on a loss regardless, correct? Okay. Okay. <laughs> and if I pay this gentleman $500 for his time to give me an estimate, although he's not going to repair my roof, you just said three minutes ago you'd have a problem with that, correct? Uh, I'm not sure I said that. He's giving you an estimate, all right? Yes. Okay, so... And I'm a homeowner, and I'm going to submit that saying you gave me $10,000, but he believes there's $100,000 worth of damage. All right, I'm... So go ahead. But you said there was a big problem with that, and for the and we'll be discussing that in years to come. Companies charging homeowners just to give an estimate on their roof. No, no, I'm talking about supplements. Okay, yeah, you said supplements are fine if they're doing the work, but if they're not doing the work, you don't want them to submit a supp or no, my an concern. Estimate. My concern are strangers to the contract to actually putting the roof on who are supplementing companies and just say, hey, tell you what, let us just look here and let us get you more money and we'll, we'll negotiate with the insurance company, get you some more money and we'll take a contingency fee, all right? That worries me, all right? I have no problem with a contractor who was the actual contractor with my insured who believes that there were things that were missed submitting a supplement. I do have a concern with these third-party supplementing companies. Okay, well... Yeah, but if, if I'm a homeowner and I'm educated enough to talk to my adjuster in saying that you are cheating me out of $90,000, the reason why you don't have the concern, the reason why you do have the concern is because I'm going to get additional money. Well, are you the contractor in that no, scenario? No, I'm the homeowner. I'm just a homeowner. Okay. Well, I'll always talk to a homeowner about what is owed under my client's claim. My client should always talk to the homeowner about what's proper indemnification for that claim. Of course, I'll talk to the homeowner. All right, I'm going to yeah. call 1-800-BULLSHIT. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not sure I understand the hypothetical. <laughs> I'm sorry. Guys, I appreciate it. Again, feel free to reach out to me. I'm happy to talk about these issues. There is a lot of common ground between us. Thanks. All right, Thanks, guys. guys. Let's give everybody a round of applause. Steve Badger came in the lion's den.